Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, all right, guys. I, I brought a few things with me today. I forgot I had them, so I just remembered, so I apologize about that. A um, couple things we do as a church. One is I want to share one of them with you about evangelism and one of discipleship, okay? Uh, so evangelism. We use several different tools. I think it's important to have all kind of tools in your toolbox. Uh, this is one we use called Our Family Tree. Uh, this is one that our church, uh, our team developed Um, And it is uh, one image. The idea was to take um, one image, uh, this image. Uh, Our student pastor wanted something that our students could put on like their water bottles and go to school or their backpacks or and something that people could look at, other students could look at and say, well, what's that? And he wanted one image and I looked at this and I said, man, that's, that's the whole gospel story in, in one image in this tree. And so uh, we call it our family tree. And, and basically what was handed to you, we developed an app for it. So you can download the app uh, by just, you can text TREE to 79969 or just easy or just uh, on this QR code. And it'll walk you through how to use it. There's some videos on there that'll tell you about each of the trees because basically what we have here. In this one tree are three different trees. You have the forbidden tree, which is where the fruit is hanging, half bitten. And we use 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So the first tree is the forbidden tree where Adam and Eve disobeyed God, ignored God, went their own way, and uh, sin, the fall, happened. Uh, their family was messed up, and it led to a hot mess. And every family's messed up and are in a hot mess. And so you can really make some inlines with people when you talk about the first family, Adam and Eve. Good place to start is creation. So that's the first tree. But God didn't want to leave us in our sinful state, so He made a second tree. The second tree is highlighted with, a, with the nails and the crown um, on that tree. That's the uh, forgiveness tree. And we talk about uh, Christ in His body of flesh, took on our sin, not His sin, our sin. Uh, And so through that, God has forgiven us. And then the third tree is all the way, it's the one with all the leaves on it where it's green. And that's the forever tree. And you can be a part of God's forever family by trusting in the work Christ did on the cross. So I have some of these. What this is, this is the app in paper form basically. Uh, so if you're interested, I've got plenty of these up here at the front too if you want to come by and get one afterward. I also have these stickers. You can, uh, you can take a sticker if you'd like. I've got one of these on the back of my laptop. I've got one of these smaller ones on the back of my phone. Uh, so I've got stickers up here. and You just come get what you'd like to take. That would be fine. So that's one way we do evangelism. One way we do discipleship, or the way we do discipleship is through this right here. This is called journal through the word. So we approach discipleship from the perspective that it's going to take time, right? It's going to take a tool and it's going to take our textbook. Now our textbook is the word of God. I tell our church all the time. We don't need any more Bible studies. We need to study the Bible. So this is our textbook. It will always be our textbook. This is merely a tool. It's all this is. Uh, I learned how to study Scripture using SOAP, SOAP, where you'd write out the Scripture, S for Scripture. You would observe with O. You would apply with A. And you'd write out a prayer with the P, SOAP. All we did was take the word, word, and develop our own. So word stands for write, O stands for observe, R stands for reflect, D stands for do. And every day uh, they will journal in the word Monday through Friday. There's no dates in here, they're just days in here. And it's empty pages where they write out what God speaks to them through that text. So they go Monday through Friday, five days a week, 39 weeks. We don't do this all year round. We go from Labor Day to Memorial Day, the school year. We take summers off. 
and we make sure that ladies are meeting with ladies, men are meeting with men, three to five men with men. We call them E3 groups because we're equipping at least three, three to five uh, men and three to five ladies. They meet once a week. They talk about what they journaled all week, the week before. They hold each other accountable. Uh, And at the beginning of these groups, it's very clear they sign a contract and say, okay, when I'm done with this group, I'm going to pull in two or three other people, start my own group. So some people can do that after one time. Some people need a couple of times before they're ready to start a group. So if, if any of you are interested in what we've done in this tool, we have a, a PDF that I can send to you. So if you're interested in looking at how we map out Scripture, for example, uh, this one, the blue one that we have is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and they journal through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We did that a couple years ago. The green one is Psalms and Proverbs. Okay, We have one for the entire Old Testament. We have one for the entire New Testament. Right now we're doing the meta-narrative where we're going from Genesis to Revelation and we're hitting on just the, you know, those texts that speak of uh, those uh, pre-car- pre-incarnate um, theophanies through the Old Testament and the high points in the New Testament. So if you would like to get one of those PDFs, uh, just give your information to Dr. Smith. He can get it to me and I'll get... I'll get it sent to you, so you can have those um, as you'd like. So those are a couple things we're, I just want to share that with you, a couple things we do in our church for evangelism and discipleship. All right, any questions on any of that before we jump into First Peter? Okay, let's go, guys. Here we go. Last one, huh? It's Friday, isn't it? Y'all glad it's Friday? Yeah. It is. It's Friday. So here we go. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now there's seven verses in, in this section of text we're going to be looking at. And in this session we're going to cover these seven. Now let me tell you on the front end, ladies, um, I know it seems uh, kind of odd that um, six of these verses are kind of written to you and then just one to the men, but that's because we're not as smart as you. We can't handle as much as you can handle. Right, So uh, we're going to work through these seven verses, but there are three characteristics for ladies and I believe three for men here that we're going to walk away with on just godly character, Okay, just being a man and woman of God uh, in any and every situation. So um, 1 Peter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that, Even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Holy Spirit, would you help us as we consider uh, the role of a godly man, the role of a godly woman, Uh, really the character of a godly man and godly woman. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... All right, Hollywood producers, they have identified 10 of the most dramatic, cinematic 
sounds. And here they are. Number, number 10, a baby's first cry. Number 9, the blast of a siren. Number 8, the thunder of breakers or waves on rocks. Number 7, the roar of a forest fire. Number 6, a foghorn. Number 5, the slow drip of water. Number four, horses galloping. Number three, a distant train whistle. Number two, the howl of a dog. Number one, the wedding march. They claim that this sound, the wedding march, evokes more emotional response than any other uh, sound. It has power to draw out sadness, envy, joy, happiness, regret, sorrow, tears, all at the same time. But what happens in marriage when the wedding march comes to a halt? What happens when you and your helpmate are at a stalemate? What happens when uh, wedlock becomes deadlocked? Like what happens when your wedding day's I will is at a standstill? And of of recent, what happens when all things COVID-19 moves your marriage to a catch-22? Well, Peter's got some strong biblical principles that lie in these verses that will help you and I be Christ-like. So that's kind of the overarching theme here. Likewise, wives. Likewise, husbands. Likewise, men. Likewise, women, be Christ-like. Likewise, be Christ-like. So what does that look like for the ladies? Uh, What does it look like to be Christ-like? You know, it's a phenomenon that we are experiencing today in real time. The institution God created, home, Government, church. The goal of all these isms we're experiencing today, whether it be communism or socialism or go down the list, is meant to destroy the home and the church. That's, what it's, that's, that's the purpose of it. And while making government God, well, government is not God. Isn't that a good thing? God is God. Government's not. Uh, so what does it look like? The government doesn't have much to say or what the government does has to say is not good when it comes to uh, women or even men for that matter. I mean they at this point in our culture with the the transgender movement it's really they really don't know where to stand on many issues because it's so confusing. So we go to God's Word, right? (laughs) And so here's what God's Word has to tell us and I think an important thing for, for ladies to understand is this, a wife, a woman, a lady, after God the Father's own heart is a powerful tool in the hands of God the Holy Spirit. So be after His heart, God the Father's heart. And and that's what Peter's hammering at here. Look what he says. Likewise, wives, uh, be subject uh, to your own husband. Now the word likewise means in the same way, uh, pertaining to, being similar in some respect, in like manner. Okay, And the same word is used both for wives and husbands. So in this family relationship, in the marriage relationship, in the family and in the home, it's interesting that both husband and wife are in authority and under authority all at the same time. Uh, Wives, according to Scripture, under the authority of the husband. Husband, under the authority of God. Wives and husbands, both in authority over the children. The children should never be in authority over the parents, right? That's backwards. So likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now, I know submission oftentimes is a dirty word. So what does it, what does it mean? Uh, it means to place under or arrange under. It means to uh, literally to voluntarily yield your rights or will to someone else's wishes or advice as an expression of love. It's a voluntary yielding, uh, considering the needs of your husband and fulfilling them. Now, this is not a 
a new principle. This is the same principle Peter speaks to back in verse 13 in chapter 2 in 1 Peter. Listen to this. 1 Peter 2 verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God. Submission, being subject to. Uh, it's a... Uh, what, what is it not? Before we say about what it is. Submission, what, what is it not? Submission does not mean that if your husband asks you to abandon your faith, that you should, you should not. Submission does not mean that if your husband asks you to sin, you should, you should not. Submission doesn't mean that you must agree with your husband and never offer a differing opinion. That is not what it means. Submission doesn't mean that if, if he is unfaithful to you, that you have no biblical recourse. That is not what it means. It doesn't mean that if he abuses you or abandons you, that, that you just have to sit quietly in the home and accept that. Uh, it does not mean that at all. Now, the Bible obviously doesn't give us direct application for every single solitary situation people are in, but the principle is, is clear. And if you ever counsel somebody who's, who's in an abusive situation, you need to clearly communicate to them as, as we try to work around the edges of, of texts like this that them asking for help is always right. Always right. And abuse is never, ever right in any situation. It should never be allowed, never be tolerated. That's what submission is not. Here's what submission is. It's the opposite of self. Let me tell you the three. You might want to write these down. This is earth shattering. This is um, trend setting right here. Here we go. You ready for this? Uh, The three biggest enemies to marriage. The three biggest dangerous enemies to marriage. Me, myself, and I. Those are the three. Me, myself, and I. Submission is not self-assertion. It's not self-promotion. It's not self It's not me, it's not myself, it's not I. It's the complete opposite of that, in fact. Uh, Submission is being satisfied at times, at times being satisfied with less than what you may deserve or claim as a right. So, wives, it's clear that you're to submit to, and this is important, your own husbands. Okay, ladies? (laughs) Uh, This is important to understand. Uh, This uh, makes much of marriage because this points out that the Holy Spirit is not commanding women to be subject to men. That's not what this is teaching at all. Uh, Women are not to submit to every man. Women, you're not to submit to someone else's husband. You submit to your own husbands. Now, I understand this and you do too. These commands are given to us in a broken world, right? Right? where relationships are broken and families are broken and every situation is far less than perfect. Every one of them. So, questions like these arise. Are human institutions, back in verse 13 in chapter 2, be subject to every human institution? Are human institutions worthy? Are they worthy of being submitted to? No. Are you worthy of being submitted to? No. Is your husband ever going to be worthy of being submitted to? No. Is anybody worthy to be submitted to other than Christ? No. See, Peter speaks here. uh, This is not simply an adherence to a principle, but it is obedience to a person. Be Christ-like. Let let me say it in, in a different kind of way. Never base your obedience on your spouse's performance. Well, he's not, he's not loving me like Christ loved the church, so I don't have to submit to Him as unto the Lord. If you have that attitude, you're basing your obedience on His performance. Never do that. 
You just obey the Word, obey what God has commanded you to do. So guard yourself in that. Uh, here's, here's what the Lord says in Philippians 2, 4-11. through 11, Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now that text is not in any way in the context of marriage, but I believe that's one of the greatest verses to apply to ourselves in any relationship. Is let, hey, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and and, and being found in human form. He, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wow. He was not obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross because of your performance. (laughs) He was not. If he was going to be obedient because of our performance, he would have never died on the cross. Don't base your obedience on another person's or your spouse's performance. So, be subject to your own husband. Look look at this. So that even, verse number 1, so that even if some do not obey the word, even if some are lost, that's what that means, and some are not saved. When Christianity was spreading through the Roman Empire, something was happening. Interesting phenomenon was taking place in that um, not all of them, but some of them faced the fact that their spouses were lost. These unbelievers were getting saved, yet their spouse was not getting saved, so it was a believer living with an unbeliever. And so the question, what do I do? I'm a believer now, I'm living with this unbeliever, what am I to do? Well, Peter says, so that even if some do not obey the word, even if they're not followers of Christ, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Uh, Peter is being nice here. Let me, um, let me uh, translate this a little bit. I guess more in our culture today. Um, don't, an uh, unbelieving wife should not nag her husband. Well, maybe any wife should not nag her husband. We don't do well with being nagged. E- even if uh, you're right, ladies, and you're always right, the, the guy never wants to admit that. and Even if you're right, don't, don't want to be nagged. In fact, Proverbs says, a nagging wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Stopping her is like trying to stop the wind. So here's, here's what Peter's getting at here. Here's what he's saying. <clears throat> he, he's saying that, of course, you want your husband to come to faith in Christ, but nagging him will never result in that. We'll never get him there. Uh, You don't want him to feel like a leper in his own home, right? Uh, So that's a good way to counsel folks. And again, let let me say this. When it says something like this in the text, that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Again, this is not a promise. This is a principle, okay? Peter's not guaranteeing that every time there's an unbelieving spouse or wife living in such a way that her conduct is pointing her husband to Christ, but he but he never comes to Christ, and that was a broken promise. This is not a promise, it's a principle. Peter is not guaranteeing that if you live a life close to God and clean before God, that you'll lead your husband to faith in Christ. But what he is promising, if you just nag on him all the time, that'll never, 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 never lead him to Christ. So the simple power of a godly life is a thousand times more powerful, Peter's saying, than any kind of tactics that we may use. Again, a lady after God's own heart is a powerful tool in the hands of of the Holy Spirit. So, wow, how powerful, ladies, is being Christ-like. It's extremely powerful. Secondly, it's very beautiful when a lady is being Christ-like. Extremely beautiful. Look, look what, Peter makes a strong argument here in verse number 2 when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And look at verse 3. Do not let your adorning be external. This is a powerful argument he's making here. Don't let your adorning be external. Okay? Okay. Um, braiding of hair, putting on gold jewelry. Now, what the Holy Spirit is not saying, the Holy Spirit is not saying, ladies, try to look as bad as you can possibly look. That's not, that's not what He's saying. He's not saying it's sinful to braid your hair. He's not saying it's sinful to buy designer clothes. He's not saying it's sinful to look your best. He's not saying that at all. What He's saying is, don't put your identity in what the world is putting 
asking you to put your identity in, which is your external beauty. Don't find your identity in your external beauty. That's the point. Find it in your internal beauty. The hidden person. Inner beauty is more important than external beauty. Inner beauty is more beautiful than external beauty. Inner beauty uh, is extremely powerful and beautiful. In fact, you remember in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 3, the Lord is dealing with the daughters of Zion. Here's what He says about them. They were being haughty. They were being conceited. Uh, they were focusing only on their external beauty. Here, here's what the Lord said. The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, talking with their feet. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will lay bare the secret parts. And that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, and the amulets, the signet rings and the nose rings, the festival robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Instead of perfume, there'll be rottenness. Instead of a belt, a rope. And instead of a well-set hair, baldness. And instead of rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth. And braiding instead of, or branding instead of beauty. Uh, So here's the key word here. Let your adorning, that, that's the key word. The word adorning, adornment, uh, is, comes from the Greek word cosmos, things set in order. We get our word cosmetics from that word. God Himself uh, gave us an inner desire for outward beauty. There's nothing wrong with looking your best. Absolutely not. God gave us that, and that's important. That's a gift that He has given to us but value inner beauty more than you value outward beauty. Um, Here he says it like this. Verse 4, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. The imperishable beauty. The unfading beauty. A beauty that lasts and never goes away. Why do we have beauty salons? Why does my wife go to the beauty salon every other month or every month? Why does she do that? Why do we have nail salons? Because hair products fade, right? Cosmetics fade. That's why you have to do this every day. Makeup, in other words, can't beautify an ugly spirit and makeup doesn't enhance a beautiful spirit. Focus on the inward, not the out. Do you know there's a kind of beauty that is unfading. There's a kind of beauty that doesn't depend on age. It doesn't depend on cosmetics. It doesn't depend on uh, fashion or supplements or vitamins or salons or diets. There's a beauty uh, that is just as beautiful when you're 77 as when you were 17. It's a beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which means a meek spirit, which means power under control. Lady, here's the idea. How beautiful is a woman whose uh, power is under God's control, who's meek, whose attitude is under God's control, whose emotions are under God's control, whose mouth and tongue and words and thoughts and deeds are under God's control, whose relationships are under God's control. How beautiful is that one who has this quiet and gentle Spirit. Uh, thirdly, I would say to the ladies, uh, be Christ-like, powerful, it's beautiful, but also faithful. Verse 5 and 6, faithful. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. And then God gives us an example. Sarah. Interesting. Sarah obeyed Abraham. Fascinating, isn't it? (laughs) Now, was Sarah perfect? Uh, No, Sarah wasn't perfect. Remember the scheme she thought up with a servant girl? Not so perfect, right? Uh, 
her and Abraham were not always on the same page, were they? I'm sure that Sarah was not very happy about, all right, we've got to leave our kindred, our family, and we're going to go to the land that God will show. Well, where are we going? I don't know where we're going. God's going to show us where we're going. I'm sure she wasn't very happy when Abraham said, hey, by the way, I'm going to take our son, our only son, the one we love, Isaac, and I'm going to go up to Mount Moriah. And I'm going to sacrifice him there unto the Lord. She probably was not happy about that. But Sarah believed that God was able to speak to her through her husband. Ladies, uh, it's so important that you get to a place where you truly believe. Again, if your husband's a believer, okay? That you get to a place where you believe, hey, God can speak to me through my husband. Yeah, God can speak to me through His wording, speak to me, but He also, through the leadership, through the headship of the family, He can speak to me, He can speak to our family, for our family, through my husband. So Sarah's an interesting one here because the Bible's clear. Sarah was a beautiful woman outwardly, right? So much so that Abraham came up with this just ridiculous idea to lie about Sarah being and tell you she's my sister. She's just incredibly beautiful, the text says. So is that why God chose Sarah? Because she was so beautiful outwardly? Well, no, God chose Sarah because as beautiful as she was outwardly, she was even more beautiful inwardly. Look what it says. Uh, For this, verse 5, is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husband as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So listen, submission. It's not about you, (laughs) okay? Submission is not about your husband. It's not about your boss. It's not about whoever. Whatever situation you're submitting to, submission is always about God, right? Okay? So adorn yourself with this inner beauty. And then look what it says at the end of verse number 6. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Oh, this what if, right? Here, fear, fear always asks what if. Faith always says, even so. Fear says what if. Ladies, you're going to be dealing with this. You're going to be dealing with, with couples as you minister to them. Wives, you'll be dealing with other wives that are going to be asking these questions. What if... Things don't work out. What if we run out of money? What if my husband makes a bad decision? What if I lose my job? What if he loses his job? What if our children get sick? What if one of us gets sick? What if we lose our home? What if we can't find a home? What if, what if, what if, what if? You you can give way to fear or you can give way to a gentle and quiet spirit, but you can't have both at the same time. When When you have fear, You know what all fear is? All fear is, is you're putting faith in the enemy. That's what fear is. You're putting more faith in the enemy than you're putting into the Lord. So hear this scripture, hide this scripture in your heart, frequent this scripture and know, hey, I can be beautiful, powerful, and faithful as I'm Christ-like. All right, guys, uh, it's our turn. Uh, I want to challenge the guys in three ways when it comes to our ladies Likewise, verse 7, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. So number one, guys, value her. Consider her as valuable. It's often said that girls usually marry someone like their father, which is why the mother of the bride always cries at the wedding, right? I know that Peter gave you ladies six verses here. He gave us one, but this is a power-packed one he's given us. Uh, So let's see what he says here to the men. Value her. Uh, Live with her in an understanding way. Uh, This is important. Uh, I would challenge every man who is married, every man who plans to get married, and every man you'll minister to in your ministry when it comes to marriage. You need to study your wife and never stop. 
You need to know her. Uh, You need to pay attention to her. You need to get to know the things that make her tick. What what are her uh, gifts? What are her desires? What are her talents? What are her dreams? Get to know them and tell her to go for them and support her. And and you need to, to, to... to loose that seed and sow that seed. So, uh, in fact, if, if you never uh, loose the seed, you'll never get the flower, right? Let her go, man. Encourage her to be all that God has made her to be. Uh, be like Adam when, when he woke up and he saw Eve. Remember his response? I want you to see his response when he woke up and saw Eve. So take your Bible and go to Genesis 2. It's very interesting what he says. Genesis 2.22, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, He made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. What did he say? Let me translate what he said. Wow! Look at this! Look at her! Right? Don't ever lose that. Study her. Get to know her. Never stop studying her. I was, Dr. Smith said, look, you gotta, you got to help us guys out who are married and tell us how to understand our wives. I'll say this to that. We will never, never, never understand our wives, but we can always, always, always live with them in an understanding way. That's important. I've yet to understand all that Tanya is because God created her and all ladies in a way that would leave us, their husbands, always with this, wow, look at her. Always trying to learn more and more and more. Never stop that. So value her. Husbands, live with her in an understanding way. Look at this. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Showing honor means to assign value to her. Treat her with respect. Assign great value to her. Serve her. and serve. How do I show honor and keep doing that? You serve her and you serve her again. You honor her, you honor her again. You pray for her, you pray for her again. And never stop that. Don't stop. Uh, The the old uh, fable goes something like this. It's a story of... takes place in a primitive culture, in a primitive time, on a primitive island, where a man paid the dowry for his wife. In this culture, they paid the dowry by cows. Two or three cows could be a decent wife. Okay, four or five cows was a very, very nice wife. But Johnny Lingo offered an unheard of eight cows for his wife, Sarita, a girl who everyone viewed as, you know, plain looking. The locals made fun of Johnny, but the village was stunned by Sarita's beauty after, after, after they were married, after the eight cows were paid. They were just amazed by her beauty. How could this happen? How could this be the same woman? How did she go from looking so plain to incredibly beautiful? And so Johnny was asked this question. Johnny said, well, guys, have you ever stopped to think what it must mean to a woman to know that her husband settled on the lowest dowry for her? She finds out that her friend's husband paid three cows for them and her husband only paid two for her. So he's, he was out, well, John, did you do this to make Sarita happy? He said, yeah, I want Sarita to be happy, but I want more for her. I want her to be honored. I want to marry an eight-cow wife. Always honor her. Always serve her. Never stop. So value her. Here, here's a second thought here, verse 7. Consider her as vulnerable. Um, consider her as vulnerable. Now, when it, when it reads like this, Showing honor to the woman is the weaker vessel. That is referring to physical, not emotional, not spiritual, but physical. Generally speaking, uh, females 
are physically weaker than males, generally speaking, right? That's all that's referring to here. And the point is written here not to remind ladies of anything. This is not addressed to the ladies. This is addressed to the men, to the husbands. So why is this in here? Is it to make women feel bad? No. It's here to challenge the men. Because God knows that Satan's going to tempt every, tempt every man to use our uh, physical, uh, we're, we're taller, uh, often bigger, uh, off, often stronger, and Satan's going to use that for us to intimidate our wives to get what we want. God knew that was going to be a temptation. So he clearly spells it out. Hey guys, you show her honor. You value her. You recognize her as vulnerable. This is not written here for the lady. This is strictly for the men. You use your strength to protect her and provide for her, not to intimidate her. We got it? We got it. Uh, And then number six, the last one here. Consider her as vital. Vital. You know, when Brady and Belle were little, I'll confess this today. I have no problem confessing this. I'll own it 100%. When they were toddlers, used to read to them at nighttime, you know, before they go to bed. I can't tell you the number of times as I was reading to them, I would skip lines in the book. I'd skip two or three pages in the book as I'm reading to them. Uh, did I feel bad about it? Yeah, I felt bad about it, but not bad enough to stop doing it. Right? It just, just wasn't, to me, it just wasn't very vital at that time. Some things are vital. Some things are not very vital. Uh, Women, uh, I mean husbands, your wife is vital. Vital. And and look what it says here. Here's how vital she truly is. Since they are heirs with you. Co-heirs. In what? With you of the grace of life. Okay? Marriage... (laughs) should communicate clearly grace, grace, grace. Right? Uh, so your wife is coerced. Th- this means if you take the wife and husband and wives, uh, what does it mean to be great? Here, here's what it means for wives. Uh, wives, don't manipulate your husband. Stop doing that. Husbands, stop intimidating your wives. So wives, quit manipulating. Husbands, stop intimidating. That's what that means. You're co-heirs with grace. And, and if, we, if, if we don't recognize this, what's going to happen? So that your prayers may not be hindered. So that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, when we think about the beauty that we see, uh, the inward beauty um, in ladies, the inward beauty in, in a marriage uh, where a husband and wife are honoring God, I think of the cross, I think of Jesus when He's dying on the cross, when, when, he's, when He's displaying, when He is displaying, demonstrating the most incredible act of love this world has ever known, was He attractive? Was His beauty on the outside? Oh my heavens. Isaiah says, look, he, He's unrecognizable. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Passion But it's hard to watch, bro. I I have to turn my head. I I can't look at that. That is is not attractive at all. That is ugly. And that is just a picture of of our sin being being ripped away from, as Christ took on our sin, just being punished for that and the penalty that, that brought with the crown of thorns and the shredding of His flesh. And He was viewed as a criminal externally, but God's beloved Son internally. Right? And he gave this incredible demonstration of love. And in him the Father was well pleased. And you are co-heirs with not only each other in the grace of life, but in Christ, you're co-heirs with Christ. So this should be our challenge today. Be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. Uh, so let's, let's, let's think about this. Brides, give much attention to your inner beauty. In fact, I, I challenge ladies with this all the time when I'm, doing premarital counseling. I say, look, on your wedding day, you're going to be absolutely gorgeous. You're going to spend a lot of time. You're going to pour into your outer beauty on your wedding day as you should. You're going to be incredibly beautiful. But I challenge you to focus 
give as much attention to the inner beauty every day in your marriage that you gave to your outer beauty on the wedding day. Pour as much into that. I would contend for couples uh, or compel couples to contend for the faith and consider Christ and Him crucified. Uh, hey, if, if you're having trouble, remember, it's till death do us part, not divorce do us part. It's as long as we both shall love, not live. I, I would encourage folks to forgive one another just as in Christ God forgave you. To be holy for God is holy. Uh, you cannot serve two masters, so serve your one master. Newlyweds and nearlyweds, draw near to the Lord. He'll draw near to you. Spouses, serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. Meet at the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Father, help us as we become godly men and women on this journey with you. May you be honored by it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys, that's it on that session. Any questions or comments or thoughts? Or... Thank you all again for your time. and This morning it's been fun. Yes, let me get this to you. Yes, sir. Dr. Greer, I, I heard one time within the context of submission, and I agree with you completely. Unfortunately, it's become a dirty word sometimes in our society. But uh, the relationship between Christ and the mm. Father, you know, that, uh, that picture we get of Christ submitting to the Father, does that make him inferior? Not at all. They're both co-equal and co-eternal. So I thought that was a good picture of submission and how it's supposed to work in the marriage as well. Absolutely. Yeah, great word. Great word there. Yeah. Yes. So what word of advice would you give when counseling people who are considering marriage that have a resistance to what the Bible says about submission, for example, due to seeing an abuse of that within their own family? What, what word of advice would you give to people who saw the negative extremes and because they're so scared of those negative res extremes, they resist it fervently? What word of advice would you give? Yeah, yeah, and, and they want to get married, right, even though they saw that. So I would encourage them in that. I, 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 first thing I'd do was praise them for, hey, Knowing your, what you've seen in the past and how it was done terribly wrong, I want to, I want to affirm you for being here, wanting to go through this time of marriage counseling and really just considering marriage at all. You know. Uh, secondly, I would walk them through. Um, I'd try to. I'd go through the 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 roles because we do that in our marriage counseling as you know as we should. Here's the husband's role to lead and to love. Wives is to submit and to help. And I'd clearly define what submission would be. Understanding. I'd say, look, we're in a broken world. These commands are given and we're, we're in far less perfect situations, all of us. Um, but the key thing is obedience. And we, have, we can't base our obedience on somebody's performance if it's in the past or now. I'd just try to counsel them in that way. And I'd point them to Christ, too, and His obedience in Philippians 2. So... Just some thoughts. Okay, I know every situation is different and difficult, but there's some thoughts there. All right, guys. Any others? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, my question is, you've given a lot of really good advice about marriage, but how? what about remarriage? Like, mm. what about someone who's been divorced and they feel like they want to get remarried to a different person? Yeah. Like, how do... I'm just wanting to know how uh, we can do stuff with that. Well, our, at, uh, my policy, our policy at, at our church is... Uh, we and we've we've had to do this a couple times. It's not easy, but but we've done it. Um, we investigate to see if reconciliation is still, um, you know, if that's still an option. Uh, so we'll interview that person that wants to remarry and their ex. We'll reach out to them and try to. 
and try to figure out, well, have they moved on? Is reconciliation possible? And if not, under certain circumstances, we'll move forward with that. And if it's a circumstance where um, reconciliation is possible, then we won't move on with that remarriage. So we do take it pretty seriously, um, again, as we should. And just approach it with each situation. Um, so that's so we do ask those questions. Hey, reconciliation, is that a possibility here? And if not, uh, we'll interview and see if we can move on or not. So great question. Yeah. All right. Yes. Any others? All right. Doc? Yes, sir. Impact on this world with the power of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray.